already seen what's coming. Hi! Hi! <laughs> Welcome to the Fosdom 2020 distribution server. Our next talk is going to be on Fedora package, Rawhide package gating uh, with the ERU e shield. So, this being the last talk of the last day, of course, I'm very thankful for everyone to be present in the room. Uh, so, we're going to be speaking about uh, a special version of Fedora, which is the Rawhide branch, and how we've implemented getting packages in, uh, in this version of Fedora. Uh, I'm not going to go into the mechanisms of, of what we get on. The idea is not to go into which tests are used to make a decision about whether a package should go through or not, but I'm going to run through the mechanism that reflects uh, the, mechan the infrastructure, the architecture, and the mechanisms that we have to put in place to be able to get in general. Uh, the question on uh, which tests are used to get are, we can discuss about that, but I'm actually not discussing the key slides here. So what I'm going to do today? Uh, I'll start with quickly going through a glossary uh, because I know some familiar faces in the room, but I also see some unfamiliar faces. So I don't know how much of the federal ecosystem you know or don't. Uh, so I'd like to to have a little bit uh, make sure that we're speaking about the same terms. Uh, then we'll go into why we want to rate to gate Rawhide. Uh, what's the anything there? Some of the challenges that we have had to face or some of the constraints and the requirements of the project. Uh, where it's at now, uh, what's the status of things? Uh, how you can debug, uh, you know, try to see if you can unlock yourself if you're into some of the corner cases. Uh, ideally, you know, I don't want to put a, this is a great presentation, everything's working, great. So there shouldn't be a debugging slide, uh, but you know, things happen, so but it is still so there is a debug. Uh, then I'll and probably explore the, the roadmap on what, you know, once we have this in place, what we want to go, where do we want to go. Uh, and then we'll finish by just more surprise for the very courageous one that's saying to the end. That's kind of a bit The laptop's not showing what's going on. So, Luther, what is Rawhide? Rawhide is the, basically the development version of Federal. It's a rolling release, it's a rolling distro. There is no there's never ever a release of it. Uh, it's composed every day, but you can find it on mirror, but it's, there's not a version of the which is present every day. It has new packages coming in and everything in Fedora lands on the high before it lands to stable release. Uh, then we have uh, how does the, the packager workflow works? Uh, it, it starts in what we call this bit, and this bit is basically a, a two uh, term that we use for two things. It's a collection of Git repositories. Every single package in Fedora, every single package in Fedora has the corresponding Git repositories in which the, the packager are uh, maintaining spec file and the patches. Question. It's also like a web service and Git hosting platform in Fedora and Red. So is this Git also a Git hosting platform? It's kind of a platform. Huge repo, hosted repos, and so exactly, it has some limitations. Uh, they are plain Git repos. The yeah. what sits on the top of it is a web interface that we have designed to sit on the top of it. But the the current infrastructure is basically two elements. It's a basic Git server, and what we call the Luca side cache, where the packager uploads the tarballs from the upstream projects. So there is a, it's really a collection of Git repo, it's not a central one. And uh, each of one each one is different, but it's playing Git underneath it. Some limitation can look after. Sure. <laughs> uh, there are some limitations, but they are uh, you can't force push, for example, if that's what you're uh, thinking about. Uh, but these are configurations that you can do to any Git repository, it's not specific to uh, our deployment there. Uh, then we have the, so once you have uh, your Git repo, your disk Git repo, you have your spec patches, you have the sources from upstream, and Fedora uses a build system. So everything that is shipped in Fedora is built in a control environment, which is called, in, uh, in our case, uh, Koji. So that's where everything is built, and builds are managed with tags. So a build in a certain tag is in a certain state. If you reach a certain, if you move to the next tag, it's moved to the next state. So basically, the tags will give you a little bit of the, the state of the package. If it's in the you know, F32 tag, that means it's available in the build root for Rawhide at the moment, which is still F32. 
Um, something that we're going to come back with is uh, they are called side tags. They are basically tags which are sitting on next to the, the usual main ones, uh, and they are used to be able to do work without impacting the, the main tags. Uh, so they are isolated from the other, but they rely on the base tag. So there is a hierarchy between the tags, so the, you have the base tag and then the, one, the other ones sit on the top of it. Uh, so the, the lower down, you can always access to tags which are underneath you, but you, you can't access to tags which are above you. Uh, then we have our update system. Once we have made a build, uh, we can say, well, I want this build to go up to the users. This is handled by an application called Body, and basically every packager gets to choose, well, that application goes to the user, that update does not go to the users. That is true for every stable federal releases. That is not true for Rawhide. In Rawhide, as soon as you build something, it's going to go to Rawhide. Uh, so there may be builds which are wasted. There may be builds that would not need to go to the users. But the mechanism of Rawhide has always been, if you build it, it goes to Rawhide. In stable releases, you can build it and say, well, actually, no, I don't want to push this one. One of the, one of the aspects there as well is also, if I push something, and then I realize it's broken, I can then push it up to a certain point. So it does not affect our users until we are kind of sure that it won't affect. Um, we have an MQP-based message bus called Federal Messaging. Uh, well, Federal Messaging is basically a wrapper around uh, MQP to make, up, to make it easy to send message on the bus. Uh, this is very used for making the different applications talk to each other. So but you will listen to messages from Koji. Koji may react to messages from another source and so on. And finally, we have something called the robot signatory. Uh, it listens to the messages coming from the bus, coming from activity from Koji, and it will, uh, so every time there is a build, it will be notified of it, sign, uh, get the RPM, sign the RPM, and move the build to us to the next tag in, uh, in Koji. So what do we want to gate Rawhide? Well, simply, Rawhide is a place which is, uh, I think that's true, fairly well known in the Ferrari community to be something which is not stable. Uh, I don't think that's, an uh, that's wrong to say that. Uh, it, is not, it is wrong, however, to accept this. <coughs> there is no reason why Rawhide should not be stable. The only reason why we allow Rawhide to not be stable is because we don't have ways of grouping changes. So if, if I build something and it dumps the surname, then I need to rebuild all the dependencies, but that can take me some time. And in, during the time that I'm rebuilding all the dependencies, well, Rawhide is broken. That leads to situations like uh, F29, I believe, or F30, when we branch. When, so we branch off Rawhide to make the stable releases. When we branched off Rawhide for F30, F29 or F30, I forgot, we did not have a working compose for about a month. Because Rawhide was broken, when we branch off Rawhide, we branch a broken federal. So there is no reason why we want to keep Rawhide broken. And getting is about preventing this breakage from happening. So we want a more stable Rawhide. We, with more stable Rawhide, we we'll get working composes. This means when we branch off Rawhide, we'll get a working compose, we'll get a working F32 for the F31, F32 for the next one. Uh, and we can already work on that project. Uh, that also means faster updates for Rawhide itself, because uh, in Rawhide, updates, the push of the updates of the Rawhide updates to mirrors happen as part of the Compose. If you don't have Compose for a month, you don't have, you're not pushing Rawhide updates out to the mirror for a month. So everybody using Compose. Rawhide is not going to get their new versions. So, can you be more specific about what Compose is in this context? So the Compose of the, in the Compose is, uh, so, the question is, uh, can we define more precisely what Compose is? Um, that's an overloaded term, which is always very hard to define. The, the basic answer is, um, when we compose Fedora, we are rebuilding the update repositories, the DNF repositories that we are pushing out to our mirrors. But we also are building our ISO image, for example, our, our base image uh, for containers and so on. Uh, so depending on who you talk to, you may be talking about a part of the process or the entire process. Uh, but yeah, when we talk about the right compose, it means generating the repo, making sure the repos solve themselves so the dependency resolution works, uh, building the, the basic images. And if one of these steps breaks, the entire compose is considered a failure and not pushed to the users. Well, and one of the f and one of the last thing we, why we want to get right is uh, we want to get in the point of uh, well, some of us have the chance to be paid by companies to work in Fedora. 
the vast majority of the, con of the contributors, etc., are volunteers. They do that on their free time, which is a, a great investment. We can't thank them enough for you know do, using your free time to come and help us and work on Fedora. Uh, it's awesome to have you there. I've been there, you know, before I got the chance to be hired to work on this. Uh, the only thing is, uh, you know, you may be you may be maintaining a package, and then something lower on the stack breaks. And they can't rebuild it because for X and Y reasons, they don't have the permissions to do that. And then suddenly, what you're doing is you're on holiday. You're having family time. You're, having, you're working on something else on your pet project. And then you get an email saying that your package can no longer install because there is a broken, there is a surname bump in one of the dependencies. And you, you have to go and fix it. You have to go and rebuild your package because someone else bump a surname and did not warn you and you couldn't coordinate the change with that person. So we want to get into the mood of uh, you break it, you fix it. It's fine to break something, you just don't, you fix, you fix it and when you push something out, it's something which is fixed, it's something which is working. So that's, the, that's one of the challenges that we, want to, what, that we want to bring to Roy. It's not okay to have Roy broken, it is okay to break things, but let's break them in a way that does not impact everyone but you until you have figured a way to fix them. So what, what are the challenges? Well, the first challenge was to make it happen. It's not the first time if you're part of the federal community, you may have heard it uh, some months ago, I would say. It's not the first time that we tried to, to, implement, to work on this, but it failed for a number of reasons last time, so when we start to look into that again, we need to be careful on them. Why did it not work last time, and how can we make it work this time? The second one is, uh, well, those are more requirements. We want to fit into the existing tooling. We don't want to reinvent a build system that will provide us the getting. We don't want to reinvent uh, a body up, uh, update management system. Uh, I'll come back to this. Uh, and we want to interrupt the, the package or workflow as, it, as little as possible. If we, every time we change something in the package or workflow, we are imposing something on our community of contributors. And you know, if you update a package every day, that is, uh, you quickly learn the, the trick to, to use the new way. If you're, if you're packaging something every three months, uh, every time you have to go back at the documentation and where is it again, and is, the, is that page of documentation up to date, or is it this one over there, or is that this email which I'm finding in my mailbox somehow? Uh, and then the last one is, uh, well, but there will be bugs. There will be bugs in the CI, there will be the bugs in the test, there will be bugs in the way we test things. So we need to have a way to handle false negative. So something which works, but it's identified that not working. So we need a way to bypass the, the result of the test in a way that is satisfactory for, the, for, the, for our packages. So having all of this in mind, uh, one of the ideas was that we would roll out the changes in phases. So we, we try to do the, the, the easy one first. So the easy one is a, it's an update that only contains a single package. It's only, you know, it's, it's a Python module that is updated that does not re re depend on anything. It's pure Python, it's Python 3, you know, it's the most simplest thing you can think of. This is the easy case. One build, one package, one update. And then as we, as we get uh, user feedback, as we get, uh, as we polish them, we also work on to, uh, how do we deal with updates that contain multiple builds that needs to be shipped as, and tested as one unit. Um, so this was our ID. Let's do single build first, let's do multi build after that. Gather feedback as early as possible and try to account for that, for that feedback as much as we can and try to get a, a police user experiment at the end of it. Where is it today? Well, we've announced at Flock, uh, so the Federal Conference uh, last summer, that we were able to do single package uh, getting. And I'm now happy to announce you that we can do multi package getting as well in Federal. So how does it work? Uh, these are slides which are uh, back from the, I just went back to the slides which I used uh, at Flock when I presented this. So for the single build getting, it's a fairly f complex system. This is basically the flow of everything. It's not meant to be read, so don't worry that you can't read it. It's just to give you an idea, every column here is a different system and then every box is a different action. The user being the, you know, the first system over there. And as you can see, the interaction with the user are actually fairly limited. There is only uh, the user, the package of start the process, and there is the override here, which is basically uh, if something goes wrong, the false ne handling the false negative case here. Do you have any steps where there's a human who has to 
will present some input or group? No? Everything is automated. So this is the, the simplified version of the large graph, which is much easier to grasp. And even for myself, that's the one I go back to when I need to, to you know, see if something is working the way it should. Um, we have a packager. They do, that person does a, a Koji build in a certain tag in Koji. So this is the, it basically, since this is a candidate for an update of the F31 that was made this summer before F31 was out. So F31 was or hide at that time. Um, Koji announces that he has built and tagged the build into this tag. Robust signatory receives the message, signs the build, and push it into update pending. Buddy gets a message that an update was pushed into update pending. It creates an update, and then it waits. When it creates the update, it sends a message to the CI system that says, this, is, this update is ready to be tested. The CI system is going to test it. It's going to come back to Buddy and say, yep, that can go, and Buddy moves it. Or the CI system says, no, that can't go. And Buddy says, well, you know, I can't do anything there. So what we, the ch one of the changes that we have introduced here is that Buddy was not part of the question before. Before you would build, it would be signed and pushed directly to the stable type, to the build route. Nowadays, everything goes via Buddy because Buddy was the place which was natural for Packager to get feedback about an update. So we are fit into the existing workflow. We change the, we change the workflow because we introduce it, but it is a natural place for Packager to receive feedback about if this something is going right or not. Um, why is it a natural place? Because Buddy, when you create an update, Buddy uh, is the place where people can report uh, if an update is working or not. So there is already a mechanism there for comments from contributors in the community to say, well, that update broke my system. Let's unpush it. Um, so this is the idea. Now, multi-build. Well, the picture didn't get clearer. Uh, the number of systems did not get smaller, and the number of interaction actually didn't get uh, that worse either. So the simplified version again. Uh, you start by creating a site tag. So this is a, manual, this is a manual step. So that changes from the way you were working before. You create a site tag, and that is your site tag. It's uh, F32 is going to be the base, so the currently F32 uh, is right, so that's going to be always F32 site and then a random integer. Well, yeah. it's an increasing integer, not a random one. Then you're just going to build in that site tag as many packages as you like. If you have two packages, you do two. If you have 100, you do 100. Once you are ready, you're going to be the one going to Buddy, and you're going to, set to tell to Buddy that site tag here is ready. Buddy is going to get all the builds that you've made in that site tag and turn it into a single update. It's going to signal that to the CI system that will kick off the. Uh, okay, no, it's, not, it's not easy, but so it's going to it's going to create the updates. Uh, it's going to move. It's going to uh, body at the at the time when you create the update. It's creating two side types as well. It's using the same ID, signing pending, and then testing pending. And when it, once you have created this two side tag, it moves all the builds from your side tag into the signing pending. Robust signatory as uh, pattern matching algorithms that says, well, everything that is F32 side something signing pending, I'm listening to. I take all the builds in the updates, I sign them, and I move them to the testing pending. Buddy gets the notification that something was moved to, te to testing pending. It marks the update as uh, ready to be tested. It signals it to the CI system that will perform all the tests on all the packages at once. So if you have two packages that need to be tested together, it will make sure that both packages are present on the system to be before the tests are run. Uh, who is the actor in this case? Sorry? Who is the actor? Uh, the actor there is the packager. Packager maintainer? Yeah. Is this like an uh, internal Red Hat employee or no. outsider? Anybody in the federal community with a packager can do these steps. How can we create uh, the tags? Fed package, uh, Fed package request site tag. So Fed package, is the, the question is how do we create the site tags? Uh, there is a utility in Fedora that's used by packager that's called Fed package. Uh, it's a small CLI tool. And there is a simple action that says Fed package request site tags uh, that basically goes to Koji and asks uh, for a site tag to be created and it returns you with the ID that of the site tag, which you can then pass onto your build command and, uh, and that you specify to Buddy afterwards. The nice thing is that a site tag can also be shared. If you're working uh, with, uh, on a, an update with a group of person, the first one creates the site tags, gives the site tag ID to the, to the rest of the group, and everybody can build in that site tag. 
and once and then once everything is ready, someone goes to body and creates the corresponding update. And so, if you're building a site there and you have packages that are depending on each other, so you have new package A and then new package B and then package A, will it take the the site tag that builds the package A? So the question is, uh, if we have packages depending on each other in the site tags, uh, how do we handle package A being present in the build route when we build package B? Uh, you, so there are two ways to do that. Uh, the hard way is to do package A, and then you wait for Koji to create the repository for the site tag before you trigger the build for package B. Or you have a, a nicer way to do that. It's, uh, it's a fair package command again that's called chain build, and that basically does that for you. It tells Koji, I want to build all of these packages and they depend on each other. And you can group them so you can parallelize, say, package A and B can be built together, but C needs package A and B. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, it, is it allowed to build the same package twice, for example, for a bootstrap build? The question is, can we build the same package twice? Um, Koji has a requirement that, is, that on the NV, NEVRA, so that's name, epoch, version, release, architecture of a, of a Package. So as long as you can, you can send to Koji, um, you can send to Koji uh, a Git hash basically to build. As long as the the, the NVR, uh, you can send it multiple times, but if the NVR has already been built, Koji will say, well, that has already been built. What can so the answer, I guess the answer behind that is, can I have a build that's present in multiple tags at the same time? Because that's you would like to send an NVR to that build. To this site tag as well as the same NVR to another site tag. Is that what you're in mind? No, no. I, I'm thinking of the case where I want to. Okay, so I want to. I have a package, and another thing to build. Was it allowed to build the same package that depends on this one? And then I want to do a full build of the first package with test enabled or some feature enabled. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fine with bumping the release in between. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, it's a bootstrap case where you start with the test disabled, build the dependency, and then build again the first package with the test enabled. So that's because it needed package B to be able to to run the, f the full test run. Uh, yeah, in these solutions, you have no choice at the moment but dumping the release uh, again. Okay. So, so a follow-up question: uh, Can I unpack a package from the the package? Can I unpack a package from the package? So the question is, can I tag and tag packages? And yes, you can tag and tag packages. If you're not allowed to do that, Koji will tell you you're not allowed to do that. But it's one of the it's one of the elements on how how can you unblock yourself if you f if you find yourself that somehow your build lost the tag, you can actually uh, you can actually just to Koji tag the tag the tag and the package name, and Koji will happily tag it for you. If you're allowed to do it, if you're not allowed, you will just say, well, I can't do that. So that's a, that's one way you can unstuck yourself. I was just wondering how much freedom do packages have for the code you like? Can someone create a freestyle target and define their own typing structure? Uh, so the question is how much freedom do packages have to configure Koji? And the answer to this one is none. This is a re this is a re release engineering uh, task basically. They are the one that will be defining the, the tags, the hierarchy. You can create your site tag based on the existing ones, but you're not going to be able to create of, you know official tags uh, on your own. Okay, that's great. Will it be possible to start the CI before the signing, or do we need to sign the package? So the question is, do we is it possible to start the the CI process so earlier earlier in the process before the signing? Um, that was one of the questions we originally considered, and the issue which we, which I had with that is that you end up if you end up installing a package, uh, you end up in, you end up testing uh, the installation of that package, not in the way the user are going to use it. So, if something goes wrong here and the package is not correctly signed, I'm going to I'm going to, suddenly my test install is going to fail because the package is expecting to be signed because in Fedora by default the the DNF configure, the UM DNF configuration requires the package to be signed. So this is going to fail. If if you say, well, I'm triggering it from here, or you know directly from the Koji build, uh, well, suddenly you it means you have to test with uh, uh, GPG no check, which basically is the different than what the user would be. So it was a conscious decision to start the CI so late in the process, but in a way that we make sure that what we test is actually what we are going to push to the users. So uh, how much time? 
the question is, is robusting that a bottleneck? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Uh, on a daily on a daily basis, no, because the amount of builds that we get is uh, low enough that robusting naturally just build, uh, takes them. Uh, it can be a bottleneck uh, during master builds. Uh, master builds is when we take all the twenty thousand re kit repos of packages in Fedora and we say, "Koji, please rebuild." Uh, so within a day or two, Koji gets to rebuild twenty thousand packages, which means robust signatory gets to sign twenty thousand packages and. If we mess up a little bit, which has happened not in this, this much bit, but the last one, where we forgot to turn on robust signatory from the start, uh, we basically had to add so robust signatory go through all the 20,000 builds, and well, copy them over. Are you signed? No, you're not. Okay, I'm signing you. Are you signed? Yes, you are. Okay, next one. Are you signed? Yes. Are you signed? Yes. And that took that basically from robust signatory. But that was a mistake on our side in a way that we. Uh, we forgot to turn on robust signatory early enough in the process. If in the case of the current master build that just happened, uh, robust signatory was, triggered, was set up correctly from the start, and basically as the build was happened, robust signatory was shunning through, and we didn't get the, the issue of swamping robust signatory, which we had at the last master build. Does nobody have any notion about the multi-builds updates? Because there is an update for each package. There is a, uh, for Body wise, there is an update for the whole group of packages, or it's separate? No. Um, so, on, in the same, in the case of, uh, yeah, in the, the the question is, is there an update for uh, for every build, or is it a different update? In the case of single build, it's one update per build. In the case of multi build, it's one update per site tag. So all the builds in the site tags are going to go into one single update. They are going to be tested as a single update. They are going to be pushed to the mirror as a single update. Maintainer has to sign some uh, body to say, okay, I've done all my builds, now you can start. Yeah, that's, the, that's one change in the package of workflow. You need to, before you had to build, and that's all you had to do. Now, if you have multiple builds, you need to create the site tags, then do your build. And once you're done with it, you say, it, okay, you can go ahead. There was thought about automating this and saying, well, we just keep on testing what, whatever is in the site tags until it passes, and then as soon as it passes, we merge it. But there is no guarantee that there is not some bills left over behind that that should be still included in the in that unit of change. As a packager, can you get any side tag? Like, can you get any combination of other packages that are even when they put in a side tag and then can you block CI for other projects just by adding them into your side tag? Uh, so if you're a packager, yeah. you can create that arbitrary side tag, right? No. You, so the question is, can I create arbitrary site tags? You can create site tags from a very specific. Uh, you can't create arbitrary. You can't create a site tag from anything. You have to create a site tag from one of the existing tags and a limited set of the existing site tags. Right, but if you have like arbitrary packages that you think that are belong together, but maybe web maintainers don't think so. So how is this settled somehow? So uh, how? Can we add pack uh, what happens if in the case where I can add, I'm adding a packages in the site tag which maintainer may disagree with? Uh, well, that we are coming back to the NVR question. Uh, to, be, to build something in Fedora, you need to change the spec file. To, to change the spec file, you need to have the right to change the spec file, and not everybody is going to have the permission to change every spec file there. So the chances are that you're going to include, that you have the permissions <coughs> To build that you have the permission to change the spec file to do the build that end up in your site tags, I'm going to say would be pretty low. Because you normally have permissions to the packages uh, you should be concerned about or that you're maintaining, and that's your own set of packages. Uh, and if you are one of the few people that have access to everything, then we expect you to know better than to mess around just for the fun of it. Um, so there is one, t there is one change between what I've presented at Flock and what is uh, sorry, what is uh, currently in action. So what you see in with the multi build is that we have we have the user it go it builds it goes to body and then to the signatory. If you remember what before and if I'm clicking in the right direction that will be easier. Um, we had it built, it's signed, and then it ends up in body. 
And I was basically creating two workflows, depending if you were considering a single build or multi builds. So we changed, we changed the, the workflow for single build a little bit. Uh, now when you build, it first goes to body. So you already have your update. That update is being signed, and then it's being tested. So we have a, we have a much more similar uh, workflow between the, the multi-build and the single build. One of the advantages here is that basically, as soon as it's built, you have a body update. That body update is in the pending state. With whatever, you know, if you have a single build or multi-build, you'll have an update in pending state. Once it's signed, you have it in testing state. And once it's out, you have it in stable. So it's, uh, it's just to make sure that we have uh, something coherent between the, the two workflows. Um, that's just a little bit on um, going through how the decision frameworks works. Um, so we have, as I was saying, we have body that says in update. And basically, um, yeah, body, body basically triggers the, the CI system by saying that update is ready to be tested. The CI system will run all the tests it finds. And it will send the results to something which is called nicely results DB. So it just a, it's basically just a database with an API on the front of it that just stores whatever we turn into it. It's a key store database. You can just put anything in there. It's backed up by Spark Drive, but it's basically a key value store. It's really, you can put anything in there. Um, every time there is a new result, it's going to announce it. I have a new result. I have a new result. I have a new result. Then we have GreenWave here, which is our decision engine. It basically has a set of rules, and it says, well, every time I'm seeing a new result, I'm going to check, well, is, um, can I make a decision now? This package has been tested. I have a new result about this package. Can I make a decision? What, is, what are the rules applying to this package? Uh, no, I'm still missing a test. I'm not, going to ch I'm not going to do anything. Hey, a new result coming. Hey, that result failed. All right, then. I already know that this result was a requirement, so I can announce that this update is not going through because that build is, has failed. Um, so this is what happened. CI, CI sends the result to result DB that sorts them. GreenWave gets the result from results DB and makes a decision based on these results and sends that decision back to Buddy. If the user disagrees with them because, hey, bugs are bugs, networks are networks, and computers sometimes fails us, surprisingly. Um, the user can override that. And overriding this is basically throwing a waiver. So you send, you send a waiver that says, this result that you find in results DB, you ignore it. You can also say, these results that you don't find in results DB, you ignore them. So if something is stuck, if something is broken, the, the, the CI system just simply doesn't work anymore, well, you're not storing any results. So your date is blocked because something is broken and just doesn't move along. So you can say, well, you know what? Just ignore everything that's not present. And then GreenWave is going to be notified about the new waiver. It's going to say, can I, make, can I change my decision? Should I change my decision? And if it does, it notifies Buddy that will react based on that. So that's a little bit uh, the framework. Uh, I'm mentioning, I was going <coughs> to mention this slide because if you're into Result DB, Green, well, Result DB, GreenWave, and WeaverDB, uh, these are the trio that's used for actually making a decision about getting out. So, how can we debug ourselves? Well, as I was saying, one of the quick ways to check the Koji tags. So, you run Koji build info, you put the TNVR of your build there, it will t you have a line that says tag, and then you just look into that. If it's uh, a single build and it's in update testing, well, it hasn't been picked up by body. Something is wrong with body. If it's uh, a side tag, then that's for multi builds, uh, then it's still a body problem. If it's in sign in pending, then there is something wrong with robust signatory. It could be that robust signatory is just doing, going through the master build and it's very busy and it's just, you know, it hasn't caught up with your build yet. Or it could be that robust signatory somehow broke the connection with the signing server and needs to, needs to have a gentle poke uh, here restart. Uh, if it's in testing pending, well, it's, it's waiting for the CI system. It could be that the CI system is processing a lot of requests or it could be that the CI system is done for maintenance or for something else. So, you know, if you're there, it's probably something in a, if you're in one of these two here, it's probably a, an infra issue. If you stay there too long, that's definitely an infra issue. If you stay there too long, it could be robust signature swamp or it needs a restart. 
if you're there, it's less a CI, it's less a, an infra issue and more potentially more a, a CI problem or a CI system problem. Another way to look into that is to look at the, the state of your body update. If it's pending, it's not signed. So pending means we have moved uh, the, we've, we've seen the build in update candidates, we've created the update as pending, and we are waiting for it to be signed. If it's in testing, then the tests are running, or the package is gated. And if it's stable, then that, well, you don't, you're not debugging anymore, it's working, or it should be working. So, <laughs> some, of the, some, of the, some of the user feedback we collected over the, over the last months was, the, first of all, the introducing body as an as a element of the right workflow introduced a lot of email notifications. Basically, a single build would give you between five and seven emails. Uh, you know, you get one for uh, your update has been created, your event has been pushed, your event has been tested, your, event, your, been, your update is being pushed to stable. Yeah, okay. Uh, right used to send you no emails. It's now sending you five per update. That's a little bit too much. Uh, we reduced it to three. Uh, it basically tells you your update is uh, been created. If the test results failed, it will notify you. If they pass, it won't. And your update has been pushed. That's basically the, the only three that you should get. If it's still too much, we're happy to revisit. This is how we the middle ground we found for now. Uh, if people complain too loudly, we are happy to revisit and see which of these emails are actually useful and which are actually not uh, that useful. Uh, when we introduce multi-build getting, uh, you may, if you're a federal practitioner, you may have seen the new UI introduced with Body 5.0. Uh, you didn't see the, 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 the mechanism underneath it for multi-getting because we haven't announced it uh, at that time. Uh, but there were some changes there, like um, the, the list of builds used to be either uh, space delimited or comma delimited, and we removed the support for comma, which made the code just a lot more complex for little gain. So now a list of builds should be uh, only space delimited. Uh, there used to be, a, there is a mechanism that goes to create all of your builds in Koji, uh, as you know, the builds you've made in Koji. And the mechanism was such that it would basically block the input field while it was loading the builds from Koji. And it turns out that that request to Koji is sometimes very slow, or that you have hundreds of packages or hundreds of builds that you've made. And so you couldn't copy and paste. So we've, that was a, a, feature that, a feature that we thought was good and that we were told, no, that's not good. Uh, so like the, the GNOME folks who, under, who update 100 packages at once, they are actually tracking uh, the NVR in the text file and then they just copy paste in the field and they couldn't do that before. So we've reverted that change. Uh, you can now easily copy paste your NVR as you did uh, before. Uh, and yeah, the next, that's the next point here. The, the logic that goes and creates body to know which, uh, to know which builds you've made is still a little bit slow and we still need to, to look at the performance there. Uh, we also the Someone that came to us and asked us, well, there is no point in having people, in allowing people to comment on an update once it's pushed to stable. And I've had of that happening to a few of my updates, and it's annoying, so please disable comments once an update is pushed to stable. And we've had uh, Adam W. Uh, coming to back to us and saying, no! Uh, because the update, turns out the update is still a mechanism where we can point people, well, uh, that update brought this and this, the Bugsilla ticket is over there. Uh, so as a user, if you run into a body update, it may actually be useful to still be able to comment on it, even though the update has been pushed to several. So that got reverted as well. If you have more feedback, I'm more than happy to take it, uh, to take it with me, uh, and I'm sure we'll work through uh, either finding a way to make it work for you or just fixing the, the whole damn thing. <laughs> okay, so where do we want to go from that? Well, we now have uh, mechanisms to, to gate something. Uh, we still need to optimize uh, testing and reporting uh, of test results for groups. So if I have uh, currently, if I have 100 builds, I'm going to create Greenway for give me the status about that build, give me the status about this build, give me the status about this build. So that's a little bit inefficient when we can tell when Greenway, when the CI system knows that it's been tested these 100 packages and could just say as once, well, you know, this group of packages that I have tested, they failed CI. That would be one request to GreenWave. That would be one way to, uh, to optimize things uh, nicely. So this is something which is, uh, which is in progress, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll end soon. Uh, then we, we still need to work on the, OK, 
now I'm going back to what I said would not be part of the topic, but it is now. Uh, what do we want to gate on? So what are, what are our tests? Currently, the tests are defined in the package repository, and they are defined by anyone, basically. Anyone can go there, and there is a specification that the test should follow. They are using Ansible, and you can, you can basically write your own test. This is great. Except that having 20,000 pack or you know 2,000 packager writing 20,000 tests for all packages and making sure that you know we all want to test whether we can install or update or remove a package. There is no need to have 2,000 people do that for 20,000 repos. We could do that for the entire distro in one go, and that's one test to maintain instead of having a different YAML from Ansible doing the same test for every single package. So we want to look into uh, distro level testing. Uh, some of them are reverse dependency testing, being able to run the test of the package that depends on me, uh, being able to install, to upgrade, to downgrade, to remove, uh, and we also want to look at the impact on composes. Does your update break compose? Can I push a new raw hide update if your build goes into goes in there? So uh, we don't know yet how we are going to achieve this one. But that is one of the things we would like to go to. Something else that we are looking into is uh, we have the agreement from the FISCO, the, so the Technical Steering Committee in, uh, in FEDERA, the Engineering Steering Committee in FEDERA. Uh, so we have introduced three test packages. So they are, they only, they are spec files which only share, uh, ship a UUID in a certain file and just you can install them, they won't do you any harm, but on the other side, you really shouldn't install them because they're no use at all. But they're useful for us because basically, um, while working on this, uh, we wrote scripts to be able to make sure things were working. And since we are touching so many systems, it's easy to, you know, to lose one on, in the stuff. So the idea is to have this script run on a regular basis, you know, uh, once a day, twice a day, every two hours, something like this, and check, is everything fine? Is everything fine? Is, can I are the tests running? Are the tests failing? Can I waive the test? Is my update going through? And then, so for a single package as well as for two, uh, a build of an update of two builds, so two, uh, two single builds, multi builds. Uh, so those are the things that we are currently working on. Uh, so that will uh, that will come up uh, soon. Uh, yeah, soon I guess. And um, one of the discussion there was on the devil list recently about the infrastructure is not reliable. Well. Using this, we may be able to look into how often things break in the entire workflow, not a single application, but the entire workflow. How often does the workflow break because one application breaks? It may be a different application at the time, but the result is, as a packager, my workflow does not work. Uh, so we may be able to measure how often things break and how often they don't. Uh, and that would also help us you know, when we roll out a new version of Body or a new version of Koji, making sure that what we want the best these are best scenario. Huh? We don't test every single edge sketch, but we want to make sure that at least the best scenario case should work fine. And uh, another thing which we have in our roadmap, and I don't know how we'll get to this, was the, the master build, the scanning up robust inventory during the master build. Uh, that is something which has happened in the past. It was annoying for a few days. There are high chances it will happen again in the, in the future, uh, as much as we will try to avoid it. So finally, a small surprise for the, all of you who have been who are Fedora uh, packager. If you're a Pansuze packager, you're probably less interested in this one, uh, and you've stayed so far. So with multi-builds, we have introduced on-demand site tags. So you can create your site tag whenever you want. Well, they work for Rohide, but they don't work only for Rohide, which means you can create a site tag for a stable release branch, which means Fed package chain build which was only a raw height feature, now works in stable federal releases as well. You can create your site tags for F30 and chain build 100 builds in there and cram them into one update in basically two commands. So enjoy that. <laughs> and that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to continue. Yeah, let's say you want to like all the CI systems inside the workflow and have the changes. So what would it take to actually just listen to changes from only on the Fedora message and then know how to report to the results? Uh, so the question is, how can I plug my own CI system in this workflow? Uh, 
Yeah, there is a, we are working on standards on how to, there is a, a very clear defined message from body that says this update is ready to be tested, so you can trigger off. The idea is uh, you trigger off Fed mes uh, Fedora messaging and you report to Fedora messaging. Uh, so there is, a, there is a defined message from body that triggers and there is a standard format that is expected for the report. And then there is one small piece of, uh, of software that basically is the piece which listens to the bus and applies the results DB that needs to be adjusted. If you follow the defined format, adjusting should be just, uh, you know, listen to the new topic and process the message that way. That's, that's all that should be required. How do we envision the reverse dependence testing? Because if your core package is unchanged, you have a standard scale, you know, you be wanting to test a thousand or one. So there are, the question is how do we envision uh, reverse dependency testing? There are a few ways to look into that. Uh, one of the first things I would do is uh, go look at my friends in green over there in the OBS world where they actually do rebuild the entire dependency tree upon a change. Uh, so that problem has been, has been solved for them, which means it shouldn't, that shouldn't be a problem to solve it for us. Uh, there are a few alternatives there. Uh, clouds? would be one way to scale up resources when we suddenly rebuild GCC and need to rebuild the entire, most of Fedora. Because the, the interesting piece about that is um, we do mass rebuilds currently and that goes through all the 20,000 packages. But the 20,000 packages don't need to be rebuilt for a new GCC update. All the Perl and Python and PHP module which are not C, uh, C uh, plugins, they don't care about the new GCC. So if we were to do uh, reverse dependency testing and rebuild for a new GCC, we would actually rebuild less than we do today with once rebuilt because we would only we would only rebuild what depends on GCC. All the no arch package here we would ignore. No, no GS packages don't need to be rebuilt. <laughs> and what about the, the feedback from the reverse dependency testing? Do you want to uh, uh, notify uh, the Python uh, manager that uh, you the reverse dependency broker? Or? Um, so the question is, how do we? What about the feedback? If I if I rebuild GCC, do I really want to know the test result about 8,000 packages? Um, those are good questions, and they, we we need to figure out uh, what's the answer for this. Uh, the first approach may very well be, well, you rebuild GCC, you're up for 8,000 notifications about uh, things not working, or maybe you know we'll say uh, not the not 8,000, but maybe we can group them and you get 8,000 in one email. Um, one way we would do that, one way which would help maybe is also looking into the, we said we wanted to optimize the, the test results when we come to groups of builds. Uh, so instead of having one build, one result, one build, having one result for the entire group, uh, that would solve that because then you have a group of 8,000 packages but you only get one, one feedback that says all of these packages are failed but it's one action and not 8,000 actions. So that may be it. Um, those are, you know, uh, clues or ideas. They are not uh, anywhere defined or I'm not going to put my hand on the table and I would say this is the way it's going to be. <laughs> uh, there was this. Um, so, uh, is that important that you can actually see the results of the previous test or So Debian has had them for years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what is it happen for us uh, the question is, uh, how do we, what, what do we need to do to actually have the install, update, and upgrade uh, test? Um, I'll say this is a, this is a chicken egg problem. Uh, as long as we didn't have a getting mechanism, we could build all the tests we wanted. If they had no impact, nobody cares. A broken test that doesn't work on the side there and does not impact me, uh, I can live with a small red dot on the, on the side of my testing bar and in body updates if it doesn't impact me in any way. We had that for years. Saskatchewan has been running and looking into a great test for a long time and they were not blocking in any way. They had no impact in any way. So, yeah. so there, is a, there is a chicken egg problem. As long as we did not have getting, there was no incentive to actually go and look at these tests and try to fix them. Now that we have this, uh, I think it's time to, to, look, uh, to look more into that problem. The question is going to be, um, it's going to be a lot on uh, the ordering. Which one should we start with? Um, 
I know RPM in spec is being worked on at the moment. Uh, it's also going to be one of the, probably one of the first distrollable testing that is being, that is enabled. Um, and one of the, uh, one, it's also used as a, you know, as a, uh, how to say, a background, okay, how do we plug in a new CI system? How do we, because it's going to have its own pipeline, it's going to trigger differently. So how do we expand our, uh, our testing system there? Um, so this one is probably going to be the, the first one and the, the next one. After that, it's a good question. Uh, fixing upgrade versus impact on compose. Uh, reverse dependency versus install. Which one should we start with? I don't know. And that's the place uh, where uh, Alexandra is not there, but Alexandra Fedorova, who works in the, the CI SIG, is looking into this question, so she would be uh, the person to contact if you're interested to help or uh, provide feedback on, uh, on some of these ideas. So the, the question is, um, how do we know, uh, where do we get the information about the number of packages present in Fedora? Um, there are two places. The first one is to look into this git, which is going to tell you the number of git repos that we have. And that's about uh, 20, uh, it's, uh, over 20,000 git repos that we have. And you can look per namespace, or you can look only the RPM namespace, and I will give you only the RPMs one, ignoring the modules, the containers, the flat packs, uh, and everything. The second one, um, we can money, and but uh, there are, there's a problem with that number is that uh, we s we keep Git repositories also for packages that are no longer shipped; they are retired from Fedora. But we still have the, the Git repos because that's part of our history of, as a distribution. Um, so that number is a bit squeezed. You get all the packages that Fedora ha has ever had, whether they are active or not. That's a different. You won't get that information there. Well, you could, but that means going through each and every package and checking if they are uh, if they are flagged as retired. The one place where you would have the actual number, and that's you you will have to you know query for it and look for it. Uh, that's called the PDC, and that's uh, that's the database. Uh, it's PDC stands for Product Definition Center, and it's a database, and that's a place where we record for every packages uh, their status. And uh, basically, if you are allowed to push to the master branch or not. So if the master branch is, you cannot push to it, basically means the package has been retired. So that's the place where you, you, <coughs> you would be able to say, well, give me for all packages the status of the, the status of each branch or the master branch. And from that number, you would be able to, to see uh, how it's going. The last place where you could see progress is going to be Body. But Body works with binary RPMs. Uh, so, you know, uh, one source RPM can give you how many sub package do we have in LaTeX again? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's up to 9,300. Something like that. So, way too much. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, the body number is going to be squeezed because the, it's only going to count the binary RPM and not the source RPM. Um, I think PDC is going to be your closest bet and that's not going to be the easiest one. The package DB used to have a feature where it would give you the number of package uh, per branch, uh, but uh, we don't we no longer have that graph. It's the same for long packs. We take the translation out of the body center. So the, the, the remark was it's the same for line pack where we have uh, one source RPM that splits a number of RPM per languages uh, so that you can reduce the, the install surface uh, on containers and the like. Uh, so and, and therefore, that's why the, num the number to look at is the number of source RPM and the number of RPMs produced. You also have a question, I believe. Oh, I forget. <laughs> <laughs>
Anything else? Is it only for x86 architecture or also for ARM? The question is, uh, is it only for x86 architecture or only for ARM? The mechanism is uh, arch independent. Uh, the problem is the CI system currently works only on x86 architecture. There is plan to add support for ARM to the, to the CI system, but as far as I know, it's not there yet. Uh, but yeah, the idea is to start with, you know, what will, if we can get 80% of the bugs with HTTC architecture, it's still better than the zero we have now. And then when we get to 90% adding harm, then we get another 10%. But it's always a 20% of the work is going to get you 80% of the benefits. And the 20 remaining percent is going to take you the 80% of the work. So using this rule, we start with the easy one, trying to get uh, the most results, and then see if we can improve that later on.